some people who learn Gemara well. Um, there have always been people who learn Gemara well. Um, but there are also some people who find it difficult. And one of the questions that we have is, how can the people who find it difficult gain the skills that are necessary for learning Gemara well? Um, and for even for those who do learn Gemara well, how can we teach those people um, and give them the, that skill set? So traditionally, the, uh, the, the method of teaching Gemara has been one of um, what I would call osmosis or mimicry. Here, let's get together. We'll learn together. You'll see what I see. You'll do what I do. And somehow over the course of time, um, you know, you'll start doing it yourself and you'll pick it up. Um, and, you know, recently people have kind of thrown in some of the um, English as a second language skills like uh, word lists and uh, translation exercises. Um, but that still leaves the, the person who's not really, um, doesn't really get it uh, so quickly and uh, frustrated. Now, my, uh, my Harusa, uh, Menachem Kazdin, is a uh, psychologist. He practices a therapy called uh, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And one of the uh, um, formative ideas behind NLP is that there's something called thought patterns. Um, there are conscious thought patterns and there are uh, unconscious thought patterns. Um, and one of the jobs of the, uh, of the therapist is to be able to tease out the details of those thought patterns. And if you take an expert in a field and you can figure out what are the steps that he goes through, you then have the tools to teach someone else to be an expert in that field. Um, basically what we try to do is to break down the steps that somebody who is good at learning Kamara does in order to be able to give step-by-step -step instructions as to what you need to do in order to learn Gemara well. Um, another thing that uh, he likes to describe is different levels of competency. You have un unconscious incompetence, otherwise known as you don't know what you don't know. Um, when you started grade school, you had no idea what algebra was. Um, then you got to the level of conscious incompetence. You knew what there was out there and you knew that you didn't know how to do it. The next level is conscious confidence, where you know what to do, but you need to think about it. Um, for example, before you learned how to drive, you didn't know how to drive. Once you took lessons, then you'd get in the car and you'd think, okay, now I put the key in, now I put my foot on the brake, uh, turn the key. Okay, now I put the car into drive. I look in the mirror, look out the window. Okay, turn the wheel. Now I can start driving. Um, finally, you get to the stage of unconscious competence, where you can do these tasks in a way that just flows naturally without you having to think about it. Ideally, once you can internalize the steps that are involved, then you don't have to think about it as much, which is what somebody who's an expert in the field does. They'll see something, they'll see a problem, and they'll be able to solve it, and it just comes naturally. Um, and just as a, as a you know, point, point of, um, of order, um, there's a lot of information I want to get through, but I, it's important to me that people understand. Um, I'm sharing my screen, so I'm not really going to be able to check the chat messages. So if there's something that's unclear or you have a question, please feel free um, to, to speak up. Um, it's the first time I'm doing this over uh, Zoom technology, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out.
Okay, one of the problems with learning Gemara is that it requires multiple skill sets in order to do it well. You have an analytics skill set. When I, uh, when I encounter a, uh, a halacha in the Gemara, I need to be able to analyze it, understand what the Gemara's conclusions are, and what we learn out from those conclusions. I need to have a reading comprehension skill set. As I read, I need to follow along line by line and see what is the argumentation that's going on. There's a memory skill set. I want to not only be able to remember what I learned, but also to create an, an archive of information that I can go back to as I learn more and be able to call, call up recall what I've learned in the past in order to enhance my learning as I move forward. Yeah. And in addition, there's yeah. a topical yeah. skill set. You want to be uh, able to put together a, uh, an overall picture of, of the topic that you're dealing with. If I were to translate these into the more um, yeshivish terminology, I can talk about analytic thinking as being learning Gemara Bi'ion. The reading comprehension is learning Gemara Bikius. The memory is what you get from being a masmid. And your topical view is building a chavura, building a topic and presenting it. Now, there are other skills, skill sets that can be used and that are used, um, whether it's, uh, you know, history or literature or um, you know girsaot and things like that but I think that these are the primary skill sets that the uh, the standard uh, Gemara learner needs to needs to have in order to feel comfortable with with learning we're going to focus today on the analytic thinking skill set so let's start with that First of all, as everybody knows, you can divide up uh, Gemara into two basic um, parts. There's what the halakhic aspects of the Gemara and the agadita of the Gemara. We are gonna be focusing on the halakhic aspects of the Gemara. For agadita, you need a different set of skill sets and you know, different emphasis on, uh, on how you approach it. So for tonight, we're definitely going to be focusing on the halachic system. So let's ask the question, what then is halacha? Um, now, if we were in a group setting, I'd you know, turn to the audience and, and solicit uh, responses. Um, so feel free to, to chime in if you like. Um, basically, halacha ends up being a legal system. Now, there's a fascinating book by a guy named Chaim Seiman, who um, basically pokes the, points out all of the uh, deficiencies in that analogy. But for the scholar who's looking to learn Gemara, the, the analogy to a legal system is, is very clear. But what exactly is the role of a legal system? So the le every legal system needs to answer three very basic questions. The first question you have to answer is, what am I allowed to do or what am I not allowed to do? What am I obligated to do versus what's optional for me to do? And finally, when I've done something, is what I've done valid or is what I've done invalid? Every legal system, whether it's a, uh, you know, uh, a, the legal system of, of a country or whether it's even the, um, the rule set for, for a board game, is answering these, these same questions. What am I allowed to do? What am I obligated to do? And what is valid? If I translate these into halachic terminology, I have what is mutter versus asr. What is chayev versus pater? And what is kasher versus pasal? Now, 
I'm using the term kosher and pasul here a little bit more broadly than, uh, than what we standardly would. Um, what I mean by kosher and pasul is that if you have a list of, um, of criteria in, for a particular action, then when I've done that action and fulfilled those criteria, then that action is kosher. If I've not fulfilled the criteria, then that action is pasul. It leads to a somewhat um, strange situation where I can even talk about a kasher chilul Shabbos. If I'm mechalal Shabbos, then I'm chayev a carbon chatas. If I did my chilul Shabbos and in the way that is required in order to generate that chiyuv, then that chilul Shabbos is kasher. If I haven't done it in a way that is that is uh, that fills fills all the criteria, then that chilul Shabbos is pasul and will not generate the chiyuv chatas. David, are questions allowed in the middle? Sure, please. So, so, so you're referring to like a, a pikuach nefesh situation, where that would be a, a kosher chilul Shabbos? Um, no, actually, I'm I'm referring to, let's say. Uh, for example, one of the things you have to do on Shabbos is have Malechas Machshavas. If I do the, the Chil Shabbos with the Machshava, then I'm Chayev Achatas. If I do it without the Machshava, then my Chil Shabbos is Pasul. I've not done Chil Shabbos in a complete manner in order to be able to generate a, a Chiyuv Chatas. So it's not that I'm doing a Chilul Shabbos, which is allowed. I'm just doing a Chilul Shabbos, which does not fit the criteria. That's why I'm saying that it's, it's, it's somewhat, um, you know, uh, strange, but I can talk about a Kasher Chilul Shabbos because what Kasher really means is, did you fulfill all of the criteria that's required for this to be considered valid? So the parts of the Gemara that we're going to be dealing with are the ones that in the bottom line deal with one of these six terms. Mutter Asr, Chayev Patr, Kasher Pasal. Now, legal systems can basically break down into two sets. There's a statutory law and a case law. It's important to understand that the Gemara is really presenting a statutory law system, but it's doing it through a presentation of case law. One of the significant differences between statutory law versus case law, now statutory law is basically the, the rule book, what, 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 what we have in, in terms of the, the, the legal system, and case law is what's adjudicated with it in the courts. If I, if I had a, uh, a traffic court and on the same day in this traffic court, there were three cases of somebody who ran a red light, then each case would get its own case number and each case would get its own decision and each case would be recorded and presented as, you know, case number one, two, three. Um, they ran a red light and they were fined, you know, 200 shekel. Um, Case number one, two, four, they ran a red light and they were also fined 200 shekel. Case number one, two, five, they ran a red light and they were also fined 200 shekel. That makes sense in a case law system. It doesn't make sense to write the same statute multiple times. I don't need to say, you know, you can't run a red light, you can't run a red light, you can't run a red light. In a statutory law system, I present only what is necessary and what is contributing additional information. Now, what that basically means is, since the, what I'm saying is that the Gemara is presenting a statutory law, then when the Gemara presents a particular case and, and its adjudication, we have to ask, what is that contributing to the statute? Or the, the term that, that we can use is, what is the chiddush of that, uh, of that presentation? So what does the term chiddush mean? 
So obviously, Kiddush is going to mean something that I don't, don't know yet. But that's really not sufficient, because if I asked you, um, you know, how much is 2,345 divided by 17, that's something that I don't know right at this moment. But it's something I could figure out on my own. And anything that I could figure out on my own, I don't need the system to tell me. So it's not just a chidush if it's something that I don't know, but it's a chidush if it's something that I really can't know on my own. I need the Gemara to, pre to, to tell me the conclusion because left to my own devices, I wouldn't necessarily know what decision to make. And why is that? Because I can give valid arguments to both conclusions. I can argue this way and I, or I can argue that way and we require the, the adjudication of the halachic system to tell us which one of those is correct. So now I'm gonna go through a step-by-step -step process of uh, presenting the, uh, how to analyze a particular mikrevedin, a particular case and its adjudication. Um, I'm going to ask uh, my son to send a link in the chat. Um, usually when I do this presentation, I have a handout that I give out. Um, and in that handout, you'll have a copy of, of this list um, as we go through it. Um, for now, you'll be able to follow it on the screen. But if you want to be able to look back at it, you'll be able to download the, uh, the handout as well. Um, so the, what I'd like to do is take the first Mishnah in Moed Katan and learn the Mishnah with you and go through this step-by-step -step process and show you how any, hala, any halacha can be analyzed, any particular case and din can be analyzed in order to reach the conclusion of what is this case and din contributing to my statutory system. So the first step in doing this is reading the text of the case and din. Now here's the full text of the first Mishnah in Moed Katan. Mashkin beit hashlachim b'moed uvashvi'it, b'en mimayan sh'yatsa batchila u'b'en mimayan sh'lo yatsa batchila, aval e'en mashkin lo mimei gishamim v'lo mimei akilon, v'en osin ugiyot lagfanim. Now one of the things that, um, you know, most uh, Gemara teachers um, stress is that you should be able to read and translate on your own. Um, given the um, amount of resources that are available today for, uh, for people to use, I think that um, there's so much out there that can help you with this. It's, it's really frustrating to somebody to have to sit there and break their teeth over their, their own translation skills. Um, that should definitely come at some point, but uh, it's, it's some place where I've seen that people get very frustrated at the very outset and get turned off. So I think it's important to make use of those tools. So for now, if we, uh, we take a, a quick translation of this, we have, you can, uh, you can water a field called the Beit HaShlachim, whether it's on Cholamoid or on Shemitah, whether it's from a newly, um, a, a newly flowing Mayan uh, spring or whether it's from a spring that's already been there for a while, but you cannot use a, um, a, a uh, gathering of, of rainwater or, uh, or, or well water, and you also cannot create these little uh, pods around your around your um, your plants. Now, what we want to do in reading the text, the first thing that we want to do is to focus in on a single halachic statement that we want to analyze. The way that I go about doing this is to look for the fir the one of those six terms that we mentioned before. The, the halachic system is built around 
mutter asur chayiv patur kasher pasul. So if I look at the first word, mashkin, and I translate that as you can water, well, right there I see the term mutar. Once I found that, I see, oh, there is, um, there is a halachic statement here. I want to see where it ends. The way to look for where, where a halachic statement ends well, if I bump into another halachic term, then that's a second halacha. So reading through this, mashkin beit ashlachin b'moed u'vashvit, bein mimayan sh'yatsa b'atchila u'bein mimayan sh'lo yatsa b'atchila, aval ein mashkin, I've now hit ein mashkin, that translates into you are not allowed to, it's asur, well, now I've got a a unit of what the text is that I want to look at. But even within this text, I have multiple halachot. We have the, the discussion of both moed, chola moed, and shmita. But I only want to focus on one, so I'm going to leave out shmita for now. And as we see, it doesn't really matter what type of spring I'm using, so I can just focus in for now on the fact that it's coming from a spring. I've now identified the text that I want to deal with. Mashkin beit hashachin b'moed mimayan. The second step is to tell a story. Every, every time that a court or a base medrash needs to deal with a halachic question, they need to understand the story. For example, a, two guys come into, uh, come into court, Ruvain and Shimon. Ruvain says, Shimon owes me 100 shekel, and Shimon denies it. What's the very first question that the court needs to ask? If you were the court, what's the first question you would ask two guys who show up making claims? Where's the proof? Okay, you're already assuming that there's, that, that there's proof of what? Uh, on what grounds does he owe you 100 shekel? Okay, on what grounds is a lead into what happened until when now? When did it happen? I'm sorry, Paul? When did it happen? That's definitely a good question to ask, but what happened? What okay. happened that brought you to here What's the story that preceded the, the halachic question that you're asking? Um, now, every story, um, you know, this is something that my kids learned in, uh, in elementary school. Every story is made up of five basic parts. There's the setting, there are the characters, there's the plot, and there's the um, conflict and there's the resolution. And all of that should go into how to tell a good story. We're not gonna do a uh, storytelling um, session to, tonight, but when you tell the story, you're looking to cover what's, what happened to bring them here. Well, let's take our, our Mishnah for example. One morning, Ruven woke up and he went out of his house. This was prior to Corona, so he's able to go out of his house. And he says, good morning to his neighbor, Shimon. Shimon says, hey, Ruben, where are you off to? Oh, I'm going off to water my field. Shimon says, you're not allowed to water your field today. And Ruben says, what do you mean? Yesterday was Yom Tov. I know yesterday I couldn't water my field, but today, why can't I water my field? And Shimon says, well, today is Cholamoid. On Cholamoid, you're not allowed to water your field. Now, Reuven and Shimon have a disagreement. Can I water my field on, on Cholamoid or can I not water my field on Cholamoid? They then proceed to the base medrash where you know, the, uh, the Chachmei Agmara are sitting and they present the question. 
are we allowed, am I, Ruvain, allowed to water my field today, which is Cholamoy? Once you have the story that goes, uh, goes into it, you can then, in essence, start from the end. You want to know what type of din is this? Now, we talked about there is mutter asr chayi patr kasher pasal. So in our Mishnah, what type of din are we talking about? We have a din of mutter. The next step is to say, what is mutter? For every din, the din is referring to a particular act, what I call the halachic act. When I say that's, that it's mutter, well, it's mutter to do, or it's usur to do. You are chayiv to do, or you are putter from doing. Or if you do in this way, it will be kasher. If you do in that way, it will be pasal. What halachic act are we talking about in our Mishnah? What is mutter to do? So it's mutter lehashkot, to water. Now, in our case, the term, the, the, the act that's, uh, that we're talking about, the halachic act, is equivalent to the act that's in the story. That's not always the case, but I'm not going to go into the details of, of that for now, um, but that's a, a, a further refinement as to being able to list out how you determine the halachic act. Once you've got the halachic act, you want to know under what circumstances is this hala the, is, does this act have this din. For example, if I tell you that it's mutter to eat, well, it's only mutter to eat under certain circumstances. Well, if it's not Yom Kippur, then it's mutter to eat. If the food is kosher, it's mutter to eat. If I've made a bracha, it's mutter to eat. What are the circumstances under which we are defining this act as being, um, as applying to this, uh, I'm sorry, as we're defining this act to have this din. In order to find these, um, these circumstances, we've put together a list of questions. For, you go through this list of questions by answering each of these questions, you will then have all of the information you need to know which, what are the circumstances under which the, the Mishnah or Gemara is saying that this halacha applies. The first question is, who? Who did the act? In our case, the owner of the field did the act. How specifically did he do the act? The Mishnah doesn't tell us how specifically he watered the field. With what or with whom was the act done? Well, in our case, the act was done with a ma'ayan, with a spring. To what or to whom was the act done? In our case, it was done to a Beit HaShlachin. Where was the act done? Well, it was done in a Beit HaShlachim. Now, the fact that we have the same answer to two questions is fine. It's less important which question is being answered than that you capture all of the information that, that you need in order to understand what's happening. When was the act done? Paul, that was the question you suggested. And in our case, the act was done on Cholamoid. What consequences came from this act? Well, in our case, there, because you watered the, the field, then your plants will continue to grow. Um, there are two types of consequences that you can really talk about. In our, in our scenario, we're talking about physical consequences. You can also talk about halachic consequences. For example, if uh, a man is mekadesh in isha, then the halachic consequence of the act of kiddushin is that she is now 
um, usher to marry anyone else. That's a halachic consequence. So whether you're talking about halachic consequences or physical consequences, they both fit under the question of what consequences are, were generated. And finally, we add in a catch-all of what other, um, uh, what, what other circumstances are necessary for this halacha. In reality, um, I, this, is, this is more of a placeholder. Um, I haven't gone through all of Shas in this method, so I can't tell you with a thousand percent confidence um, that the first seven questions cover everything, but so far they've stood up to time. And David? Yes. Hi, this is David. Is this more or less a specific order of questioning or not at all? Um, I don't I don't see any dependence on the order of the questions. Um, I find it hard to remember lists. So um, to me, it's easier if I keep them in an order in my own head. But as long as you cover all of the questions, um, and, and actually once you, once you get uh, comfortable with it, you don't even have to cover all of the questions because you'll you know, intuitively understand that some questions are, are not necessary in this instance. But as long as you cover all of the questions, then you will have the information you need in order to figure out what are the circumstances that generate the DIN in, in our case. Is there a usual in terms of how many of these questions need to be answered to be able to reach conclusions and move forward? Um, I, I can't really tell you, but um, my gut instinct is um, anywhere from one to four. Um, I haven't really found a case where more than four were necessary um, in order to generate the the uh, the halacha. Um, but I can't I can't tell you for sure. Okay, thanks. Um, well, once we've answered these questions, we can give a visual representation of. Um, of our case and, and its din. So we put our input conditions as going into the act. When you have these conditions, this act will generate the din. In our case, when the Bal Hasada uses a Mayan to water a base Hashlachin on Chol Moed, and the plants will grow because of that, then this is an example, or this is a case in which the din will be mutar. In the handout, you'll have a, uh, a, an empty one, and you can use this on your own anytime you encounter a, a halacha that you want to analyze to fill in these questions to give you a complete picture of under what circumstances will the halachic act give you the din that you've determined? The next step as we go along, now, as David pointed out, not all of these questions, or rather not all of the answers to these questions are necessary in order to generate the din. And we wanna go through the process of determining which ones are relevant and which ones we can ignore. Which, which ones are relevant means which are the ones that actually generate the outcome. Now, the way we do this is by going through them one by one and questioning, if I were to replace this with something else, would it be, would the din remain the same? If so, then this isn't really the thing that is generating the din. So, in our case, who is doing the act, whether it's the, the owner of the field or somebody else who's doing it in his stead, doesn't really matter. So we're gonna, oops, we're gonna leave out um, who is doing the act as a generator for this din. How the act is being done isn't even specified. So anything that's not specified 
we can leave out. It's possible that as the Gemara develops this topic, they'll answer the question that hasn't been answered before and give you information you didn't have before, which will turn this into a relevant input condition. But for now, until we know that there's more here, we can just ignore that. Now, the fact that it's being done with a mayan, with a spring, is definitely um, relevant because if we remember the end of the Mishnah, the Mishnah said that if it's not a spring, if it's Megishamim, the din would be different. So that definitely needs to be there. And Beit HaShlachin is also something that needs to be there since if the Mishnah went out of its way of telling us you know, such a clear um, uh, prat about the case, that's definitely something we need to take into account. However, we only really need the information once. So we can leave it out. If it's used in two places, we can leave it out. When this is being done on Kol Amoed is definitely something that is important. That's actually the topic of the, the story that we're talking about is Chol Amoed. And finally, the, uh, the consequences, well, for, if, for those of you who, who don't, don't know the definition of Beit HaShlachin, the definition of Beit HaShlachin is a field that will be, uh, that does not receive enough rainfall in order for the crops to grow, and therefore you need to water it. So the consequences that you're your plants will grow is really a repetition of the same information that we have from the fact that this is a Beit HaShlachin. So for now, I can drop that out as well. And we did not find any other information that we needed to include, so I can ignore that. At this point... Can I ask a question here? Sure. It's Miriam Hirschman, sorry. Are those answers, meaning what you were able to get rid of here, generally generated from inside the halachic text that you're reading, or do you need to have external information to know that? Um, well, I'd say it's a combination of, of the text that you're dealing with and the story that you've told. Okay. Um, now, there, there are some times where you won't know if something is, uh, is relevant or is not relevant, is necessary or is not necessary, um, and then you, uh, you can leave it in and see as you develop the topic, you know, if you get more information that will tell you, did you make the right choice or not? Okay. So the next step is to summarize. We take those, specific, those relevant um, input conditions and say, those are the input conditions that generate the DIT. In our case, we would say it's mutar lahashkot, beit hashlachin b'chol ha-moed mimayan. Basically, all I've done is taken the relevant information together with the halachic act and the din and stated it as a ruling. Okay? Once we have this din, we want to know, well, why do we have this din? What is it teaching us? Now, as we said at the beginning, the idea of a chiddush is that I don't know what, what the ruling should be. Now, the reason that I don't know what the ruling should be is because I have some previously adjudicated case that's very similar that has a ruling in one way. If my question is, should this be mutter or us, or I have a case that it says usr. But I have another case, which is also very similar, which has the opposite ruling. It has a din of mutter. And now I'm stuck. I don't know, is the case that I'm dealing with more similar to the adjudicated case in one direction or the other? Now, in our case, I since the, the ruling in this case is mutter, I would look for what is an usser case in order to be able to contrast between the case that I have and some previously adjudicated case. 
Now, a simple example of a case that will be usur is if we weren't talking about Cholamoid, if we were talking about Yom Tov itself. On Yom Tov, I can't water, can't water my field. So if I change the input condition of when from Cholamoid to Yom Tov, I will change the, the adjudication from Mutter to Asr. On the other hand, there is a clear case when it, this should definitely be Mutter. Well, if I change my when from Cholamoid to a regular weekday, then it will definitely be mutter. I can definitely water my plants on, on a regular weekday. I've now set up that I have a clear case where it's asr, a clear case where it's mutter, and the chiddush value that we've gotten out of our case is that cholamoid, at least given these set of circumstances, is considered like whole, that it, this, the adjudication will also be mutter. I can generate a chiddush using any of the other input conditions if I wanted. For example, if I change Beit HaShlachin to Beit HaBau, Beit HaShlachin is a field that does not get enough rainwater. Beit HaBau is a field that does get enough rainwater, and I don't need to uh, to, to water my field in, for, for a Beit Habal, that will change my din from Mutter to Asr. Or if I change, as the Mishnah does at the end, from, from a Ma'ayan to Megishamim, then I will also generate an alternate case that where it will be Asr. I've, I can set up the same um, dichotomy between a case that I definitely know is one way and a case that I definitely know is another way, and my case falls somewhere in the middle. Once you've identified the chiddush, we want to know why is this the case? Or really what I want to know is what rule does this ruling teach me? Because as we said, what we're really looking for in, in Gemara is a statute and not just a case ruling. So how do I go about finding what the ruling is? I want to answer the question, why do these circumstances generate this outcome? In order to do that, I ask the question for each of the relevant input conditions, do, is this a specific instance, meaning only this will generate the, the outcome, or is this a represent, re, representative of a category that will generate this, um, this day? So, for example, our first um, uh, necessary input condition that we're going to deal with is beta shlachin. Is it true that only if this is a Beit HaShlachin, I will be allowed to water? Or does Beit HaShlachin represent a category? Now, Rashi on the Mishnah er, answers this question for us. The, Rashi says, Mashkin Beit HaShlachin b'moed. First, Rashi defines for us what a Beit HaShlachin is. Sadeh shehi omedet bahar, v'tzarich la'ashkota tamid. It's a field that is situated on the mountain and therefore the rainwater is insufficient and you have to supplement with your own watering. You're allowed to water it even on Chola Moed. And here is where Rashi tells us why. Because not watering would generate a significant monetary loss. It may no mashkeota. The davar shall have said he tiru chachamim litrachbo becholoshal moed. So Rashi tells us that really I can replace the chol um, moed with um, have said, or in uh, another 
uh, synonym for that in halacha terminology is davar ha'aved, something that you would lose from. Similarly, um, a mayan is not, it's not just the mayan that, that can, that allows you to do this, but the mayan represents something that does not require tircha. Um, the Gemara actually talks about this um, when it discusses it. Um, that's something that, that uh, you might not necessarily know when you first encounter it, but um, that's, that's what the mayan represents. I can also generalize the act itself. I'm not only talking about watering fields, I'm really talking about any malacha. There are malachos that I want to be able to do on cholamoid. And um, if I want to know, am I allowed to do a malacha on cholamoid, I would want to generate this, um, uh, th this outcome. However, the final input condition is cholamoid. And there is no such rep group that is, or category that is represented by cholamoid. We're only talking about cholamoid. Given that we've now generalized the input conditions to whatever extent we can, we can restate the ruling as a rule or as a statute. Let's take a look at the Rambam. The Rambam writes in uh, Hilchot Shvitat Yom Tov, in the seventh parak, uh, in the first two halachot, in halacha Aleph, the Rambam gives us the background information. I'm just going to uh, read the, uh, the bold items. Cholo shel mo'ed, yesh malachot asurot bo, v'yesh malachot mutarot bo. On Chol they are going to be some malachot that you're allowed to do, and some malachot that you're not allowed to do. And what are these malachot? That's what the Rambam says in Halacha Bet. Ve'eluein kol melacha she'im lo ya'aseh ota b'mo'ed yesham hefseid harbei osin ota. If you are going to encounter a significant monetary loss, then you're allowed to do melacha. Uvilvad. However, shelo ye ba Torah harbei. You shouldn't have too much, um, too much work involved. If we look back, the Rambam has basically um, analyzed this, th this case the same way we did. If we were to read our analysis, we have, it is mutar to do melacha on chola moed for a davar ha'aved as long as you don't have tircha. The Rambam, who writes in, in a presentation style of a statutory law, writes the, the statute. You can do melacha if there's hefseid and there's no tircha. And then he brings the example of our Mishnah. Kate said, mashkin beit hashlachin be moed. So basically what we've accomplished this evening is to go through a step-by-step -step process of analyzing a particular case and din and generate from that case and din the statute that is in essence hiding inside of, of the, the case and din. Now, I've, I've worked pretty hard on, uh, on going through this and I hope hopefully I've done it in a manner that's relatively clear. Um, this is definitely an example that works very well. Not every example is going to work quite as, uh, as cleanly. And actually the very fact that it wouldn't work as cleanly is going to give opportunity for um, alternate explanations or alternate ways of, of viewing things. Um, any questions uh, at this point? Yes, when is the next topic being presented? Um, Wednesday at the same time, 8.30. And, this is really, really great, David. And uh, next time, what I'm going to do is give, work through another example 
Um, in the handout, you'll see that's the the Gemara on in Makot on Dav Ched um, and in that case, it's going to be more complex. It's not necessarily going to fit uh, or have clear cut answers as we go through, and we'll see that that really gives you the opportunity for a very rich um, understanding or alternate understandings of of, of the uh, the halachic system, and as we do that, I'm also going to touch on um, the uh, the uh, reading comprehension skill set. Um, that's the next uh, big skill set that that I'm working on in terms of um, detailed uh, instructions. Um, and if we have enough time. I'll do a quick overview of an example of uh, building a topic using the same, the same set of, of tools. So thank you all very much. And um, if anybody thank has you. questions. Um, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday.